Already? I'm going to get us started. Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with um, our first panel. So I have uh, the joy of moderating the trans feminisms panel. I'm Megan Burke. I'm associate professor of philosophy at Sonoma State, and I also am a graduate of the U of O philosophy program. So it's great to be here. Um, even better to be here with this amazing panel of speakers. Um, so we have three wonderful speakers who I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, they are each going to have 30 minutes to uh, deliver us some remarks, and then we'll have 30 minutes of questions um, at the end. So I encourage you to uh, diligently take notes and write your questions down, um, and then we'll reserve that time at the very end um, after all of the speakers. So we're just going to go in the order um, of the panel. Um, but before I begin to introduce them, let me just say that because we have one uh, person zooming in, um, you may hear a delay um, in the audio from the mic, and that's just what's going to happen. So please uh, bear with us and try to uh, you know, do your best to, to get through any um, audio dissonance that you may experience. Um, so we're going to begin now um, with Talia Betcher, who is professor of philosophy at California State University, Los Angeles. Um, her work in trans philosophy and feminist philosophy has no doubt opened the doors for many of us to do philosophy in different ways. Um, and she has way too many important articles for me to name, so I'm just going to mention the ones published in Hypatia, Evil Deceivers and Make-Believers on Transphobic Violence and the Politics of Illusion, published in 2007, Full Frontal Morality, the Naked Truth About Gender, published in 2012, and then What is Trans Philosophy, published in 2019. She is currently completing and almost finished a monograph entitled Intimacy and Illusion, an essay in trans philosophy with the University of Minnesota Press. I was gonna um, take the podium, but now that the microphone is here, I think I'm just gonna sit here and not go there will be easier. And also, um, it's easier for me to pass this on uh, to Doss, who uh, graciously agreed to sing um, part of his, apparently he does really important voice work and stuff like that. And I was really excited. And I know he was singing before, the, right? <laughs> um, so before, I'm going to do a kind of a, a, a shameless promotion, but it's not a promotion uh, for me, but it's an acknowledgement of sort of what's happening, certainly in this country and elsewhere, the rising tide of anti-trans sentiment. And so, you know, um, those who know me know that, you know, I care about action more than anything and philosophy that doesn't have that kind of like, you know, uh, that kind of output, you know, I, I question its worth when it's about these matters. Um, and, and so the, basically, a student had reached out to me in Florida, and um, they were like, they, they said they wanted to work with me at the master's level. And it was like, you know, I was kind of flattered. They want to work with me, you know, blah, blah, blah. But they wanted to get the hell out of Florida. <laughs> That's the main thing, honestly, because it's like, you know, um, and unfortunately, our master's program didn't have a lot of funding for, for students because we're like, you know, a Cal State system. And so the idea to create a fellowship um for um um uh, a fellowship in trans trans studies at cal state la was born and uh we've already or will be awarding one this year but basically you know the recipient the, the winner um can receive up to ten thousand dollars for the year and you know they end up being mentored by someone who works in the field which will probably be me um in any event We've already fundraised sort of the money we need for this year, and I'm very excited how quickly that went. But I am going to ask you now. I'm going to make a request for like money. Sorry, <laughs> um, and uh, to to find this site and to find the, find the instructions for giving, just go to the Cal State LA Philosophy webpage, and there you'll find it with all the instructions. So I'm really encouraging you to do that. 
it's for an important it's for an important um, issue. And you know, I think that we need to do all that we can for trans students. You know, um, particularly those living in really really uh, difficult states. Um, okay. Um, so originally I thought that um, I should say something important about you know the history um, of trans feminism and its relationship to feminism and to Hypatia and all those things and um, you know talk about some of the difficulties, some of the you know the the, the traumas that Hypatia and Hypatia's community sort of underwent over time, the rise of um, the delay is getting to me, it's really weird. <laughs> um, and the rise of gender critical feminism and all that kind of stuff. But I have to tell you, honestly, I'm like really, I've been working really hard on a book for a very long time. And I sometimes feel resentful when I need to pull away from that to focus on a topic that someone else dict dictates to me. And I find that so much of you know trans philosophy you know is forced to be in response to hostile attacks and that shapes it right um it means that automatically your work is going to be ap apologetic in nature and as a consequence it distorts it distorts if you wanted to get a liberatory picture of what you're up against and so for me one one possibility in trans philosophy um, is trans philosophy as illumination, which for me is illumination against the backdrop of what I like to call the existential what the fuck, right? Which is very real for, for all those who experience oppression in one way or the other. You know, so-called common sense is not common sense. It's why does this make sense? It makes no sense to me. And so in comes, you know, here's, here's, a, here's a good role for philosophy to illuminate. Um, and if you're trying to illuminate oppression, your experiences of oppression and possibilities for resistance, if your account is already apologetic in nature, it's not going. It's going to be automatically um, tainted from the outset. It's going to be something that will not ultimately serve you. And so, at least this essay, this book that I'm working on, um, on intimacy and illusion. Is is of this sort. So it's a um, an effort at making resistance sense in the face of um, various forms of trans oppression. And so what I wanted to do is just give you a little bit of an overview of the book, and then talk you through some of the preliminary moves. And the good news of doing it this way is I have so much to say that I can just be sort of like you can you know make you, you can just sort of say done. And I'll stop talking in the middle of a sentence and whatever. I'll, and you know, and that's good for me. You'll look forward to the book coming out. <laughs> um, so what is the book about? One is sort of two formal goals. One is providing a different account of trans oppression. And the second goal is providing a different account of what I call phoria, transgender phoria. Um, which is sort of a perversion of the Greek phoria, meaning carrier. But I like phoria rather than dysphoria or euphoria because dysphoria tends to be pathologizing. Euphoria, uh, euphoria typically sounds a little bit too fucking happy to be believed if you're trans. Um, and so you also want the possibility of valences and complexities. But you know, a sort of an adequate account of you know trans experiences of of gender phoria. And so this account, you know, puts the two together and regards transphoria as inherently bound up with trans oppression, um, sort of pushing against it. So it ends up being inherently resistant in character. Okay. Um, now here's sort of like the the big punchline is that in order to do this, um, you need to overthrow a lot of things that we have in philosophy, a lot of central concepts. So in the end, I want to challenge basic concepts in philosophy like person, self, and subject, suggesting that the underlying presumptions there 
are both false and abusive. But at any rate, we're going to need to overthrow those assumptions if we want to tell this story, right? Um, okay, so to clarify the two goals, um, we already have, I think, two leading accounts, um, trans accounts, if you will, that are trans friendly. And one is this account of trans oppression, which appeals to the gender binary as the as the source of all trans oppression. And while I do think that it's true that the notion of a binary has been oppressive to many people, and let's just clarify for the sake of argument that by this we mean the thought that there is you know, a strict binary between male and female, masculine and feminine, men and women, and moreover sort of this alignment between the three pairs. I do think that um, many folks, including trans and non-binary folks, are oppressed because of the insistence on this. However, I don't think that it's adequate. I don't think that it captures all of trans experiences of oppression or all of the structures of oppression. And I worry that it will invalidate um, some trans self-identifying claims. So if you identify as a trans woman or as a woman, or if you identify as a, as a man, right? And your concern is precisely with sort of the binary alignment, you may be subject to accusations of being reactive, of being part of the problem and so forth, which I think leads to a very bizarre result because anyone who is trans, you try to live your reality in this world and claim your identity knows that it's not an easy, you're constantly fighting to have your identity respected, regardless of what your identity is. So I think that something has gone wrong there, and I think that something more is needed. Similarly, I think that the other sort of account that we've had for a very long time is that more of a, a medical account um, of, of transphoria, this notion of the wrong body. So this idea of being trapped in the wrong body and this experience of sort of like the body being at odds with one's sense of self. And, you know, I've long had concerns about this as well. And I think most people are aware of the sorts of concerns that are going to come with this. Certainly, if you think that gender identity or this experience of incongruence is innate, you're on your way to, as it were, making claims about gender sort of being also innate or biological that you may not really want to sign on to as a feminist. Certainly, I don't. But also, I think that the, the account that you get in the wrong body model is um, inadequate to explain the complexities of actual trans people and their phoria. So we need something more. So the vision that I'm proposing is grand, um, no doubt way too grand, which is why it's taken me, you know, a thousand years to even get close to finishing. But really the, the goal is more humble, and that is to sort of provide a new vision, a new way of looking at things that is not necessarily total, but, but hopefully helpful and hopefully new, and hopefully providing new ways of, of thinking about these things. How much more time do I have? So let's get into it then. Uh -huh. So I want to then at this point now start talking about my, my sort of way of seeing um, oppression and why I look at it that way. And I want to make some moves. Okay, so I think that it's not uncommon uh, for us to think about oppression in terms of, you know, categories, being oppressed on the basis of categories. So on the basis of certain perceived characteristics, you're categorized, and then you're oppressed on the basis of that categorization. Now, I think that this operates at too high a level, too abstract a level. I mean, and to put it crudely, I think that the problem is that it elides the ways in which concepts and the various deployments of concepts or terms designating those concepts are themselves oppressive. 
So let me give you sort of one trans specific and one more general reason for being concerned about this approach. I mean, if you're focusing on, you know, trans misgendering, gender identity valid invalidation, then it, you're really hard pressed to appeal to this model to make sense of trans oppression, okay? Because this is the truth, right? It's it's typically not, or at least not always not, the case that when you are invalidated, it's not because, oh, this person is trans, let's go mess with them. If you're a trans woman, what's going to happen is this, oh, that's really a guy in a dress passing themselves off as a woman, let's go harass them. That's the categorization. And you can get that whether or not trans is even in the ball game. So that seems like a really lousy way of sort of beginning if you accept that as the categorization. Do we make sense then of sort of the oppression of men who think they're women? Is that a, it's not a good way to start. It also goes the other way when you think about ways in which um, trans people ourselves self-identify. We self-identify in complicated ways that may or may not involve trans. And so if you're not careful, when you sort of focus on this specific, you know, trans, you may not, well, I don't identify as trans, identify as trans, whatever. You can imagine how this goes. Uh, Self-identifications are very subtle. Does this make sense to you about why I'm a little bit worried about this categorization model? Here's a more general reason to worry about it, and that is, you know, categories are basically like, you know, hotshot concepts, right? And um, concepts um, can be oppressive and they can be subject to resistance. So let's just take, you know, the category woman, right? So you may think that if you thought that various sexist things were built into the concept, right? Women are like, supposed to be fragile and delicate and dependent upon men, let's say. Okay, it's a little bit antiquated. I mean, that's not, I mean, already you're going to worry about laying that down as the concept that you're starting with because you're going to want to unpack it, right? But note that there's far more, it's the, 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 cate the category woman though is not just about the sexism, right? Because you can unpack this in terms of its being heterosexist by presupposing this sort of like heterosexual relational dimension, and you may want to resist it because of that. Furthermore, you, it's clearly a racist concept that privileges a certain kind of like white femininity, right? In which, you know, if you are a woman of color, you're going to end up being marginalized with regard to the category. So you may, may wish to resist that concept in that respect. So now you have what it turns out you have this category woman that is oppressive in multiple ways. And then if you think that folks who resist sometimes develop resistant concepts, you're going to have a, a multiplicity of resistant concepts that are responsive to different modalities of oppression. Are you following me? So now the question becomes, what is the starting concept of woman that you're going to use? automatically you're picking sides, which is sort of, by the way, the, you know, one of the reasons why I'm so firmly against the ameliorationist project, this thought that we must, you know, um, as philosophers determine what the word woman should mean and either at least get the philosophers to go along with it, if not everyone else, which is a very silly project, if you think about it in and of itself. But sort of more importantly, it sort of misses the point, like, you the stuff about like what is a woman and what these concepts do and how they're being contested happens on the ground so you're going to come from on high and what you thought through all these issues now carefully and in great detail no you typically haven't you've busted a few philosophical moves um and you're going to tell people how to how to use this i mean it's it's not it's not a serious project so I think that that already makes feminism interesting. I mean, I'm not the first to say that, you know, when you start your feminist project, I mean, you're not going to be able to start with sort of like a solidified, this is the category woman. You're going to have to recognize the concepts themselves are part of processes of oppression. 
and resistance. You with me? So I think that this is too abstract. And so I like to focus a couple levels down by looking at concrete forms of, of, of violence and oppression and abuse, right? So, I mean, if you look at like sexual violence, like various forms of rape, I mean, you can just look at that and start theorizing that and look at the practices involved in that, right? And then also look at the ways in which the word woman is deployed or not deployed in those circumstances, right? Um, and for me, the thing in this book that I focus a lot, a lot on is what I call reality enforcement. And if you're familiar with my work, you know that this has been a long-standing concern of mine, and it, you know maybe a little bit of an obsession. Uh, but if it's an obsession, it's because I think it's a really big deal, right? And so it's a form of misgendering whereby trans people are represented as really a so-and-so disguised as a such and such. So you now have an appearance reality contrast. And this takes two forms. One, it takes the form of a deception. So being viewed as someone who has deceived or tricked someone. Usually this represent, representation is used in the context of violent assaults against trans people as a sort of justification. And you know, the other view is, uh, the other representation is, is that of a pretender. So you're pretending, you're playing, you're playing dress up or makeup and uh, a bit more harmless, but something we're not gonna take quite seriously. One of the interesting things about this phenomenon is that it's not just about the concepts, it's about underlying social practices that concern public gender presentation and ways in which we're coding the body. So I specifically think of it in terms of ways in which we sort of code the body in terms of what I call moral sex. And maybe I'll get a chance to explain exactly what I mean by that in due course, right? But typically what we get is sort of, a, you know, a, a deception or pretense, the appearance reality contrast is spun out between gender presentation and moral sex. Here's a way of understanding what I mean by more. I mean, like, you know, so like often genitalia in, in sort of folk, environments are taken as decisive in determining sex. But notice that, you know, the way that this is sometimes done, for example, by grabbing a trans person between their legs, um, stripping them, forcing down their pants, right, is sexually abusive. So here we have body parts that are subject to boundaries. That gets us to where, what I mean when I'm thinking of moral sex the body parts are bounded and even discussion of the body part is bounded so if you go up to someone and you say hey do you have a penis or a vagina you know the right answer is do i know you why are you asking me this you know and even if your friend over lunch is like so, so, so tell me about your vagina i mean you're like what why no boundaries on discourse yeah so this contrast between public gender presentation and moral sex is important. Um, and a lot of the book is about thinking about that and making sense of that. Um, where am I in terms of time? Six, that went fast, didn't it? Okay. Um, so in this book, I'm focused a lot on, a, a lot of my work is focused on the deception side of the bind. And this work is focused more on pretense. And I think that it's actually really quite important for, for many of us trans people. I mean, there's a way of thinking about, oh, if you're trans, you're just viewed as pretending and you know, you're not really interacted with. But I think that there's this really important phenomenon of playing along. Where non-trans people want to form relationships with trans people and they play along. Sometimes they may even be in denial about whether or not they're playing along. They may think that it's a real, they're, you know, they're really taking this person seriously, but they're in fact not. But it doesn't come out until later in the wash. And we'll note that it comes out in typically two scenarios. 
both concerning intimacy, and I call these the calamities of intimacy. So one is when it comes to sex segregated spaces, where you know you may be accepted, right, um, in an office space, but then if it comes to using your your gender appropriate bathroom, now there are worries about men being in the women's bathroom, and so forth. Um, the other calamity is having sex with the wrong person. So like if you see yourself as attracted to, um, you're, you're a straight woman and you're attracted to men and you're treating this trans guy like you know a man and it seems all great until suddenly intimacy emerges and it's like, oh, wait a minute. What that indicates is not only that that context is not a context of gender validation, but it, it, it invalidates the whole thing because it shows that the whole thing was merely playing along. And so I think that that means that a lot of what we think of as trans acceptance is not trans acceptance. And I think that that's really difficult for us to wrap our heads around, or at least for some of us, because even the most well-intentioned people at some level, right, have not altered their conceptions enough to accept trans people in order for trans people. So I think this helps us, one, see um, how some of the progress may not necessarily be the kind of progress that we thought it was, and realize that there's more to this than using the right pronouns and using the right categories. So this is what most of the, um, the book is focused on, but also thinking through this idea of pretense as a site of possible resistance. And this is where the foria comes in. I think that a lot of like, or not a lot, but a lot of like trans experiences of foria prior to transition, come in states of make-believe that, as it were, see through ways in which make-believe is constituted in the dominant world to understand that there's something far more complicated going on and that this social state of make-believe is not what it appears. That's too hard to get into right now. Um, and I had this whole piece on um, intersectionality and thinking through um, the relationship between reality enforcement and other modalities of oppression. Um, and so I'm going to zoom through this quickly. One of the things that you'll see, right, I mean, I think when we think of intersectionality, we need to understand that it originated, right, in the work of, you know, um, Black activists and Black theorists, and it was deployed for a specific purpose. Right. And and keep that in mind when when, you know, sort of just automatically using it in various different cases, because it creates facile analogies between various forms of oppression. Um, but one of the interesting things is this is reality enforcement can be sexist or involves sexual violence. Right. But what's interesting is typically you would think that it's you know, trans women who experience that blending of sexual violence and reality enforcement, and trans men don't. And so there'd be a privilege based in there. But that's actually not true, right? What happens is the way in which sexual violence is used against trans mask individuals, right, is to prove that they're really female. And ways in which uh, trans feminine individuals um, experience this is in the context of it merely being pretend, pretend. So it's sexual violence, but it's sort of like, say, a force feminizing violence. And there's interesting issues of thinking, like, if you're being treated as a pretend woman, how can it really be actual sexist violence? And that's an interesting, but, but it is, right? It is, and it does happen that way. So thinking through these issues, I think, are really complicated. And um, how much time? One minute. So I don't, so I was then going to go into sort of like thinking through the complexities of these intermeshing oppressions, right? And I think one of the most important is trans sex work, because there you see certainly in this country, you know, you know, um, 
reality enforcement, sexist violence, racist violence, sort of institutionalized racist violence, and, 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 and you see the relevance of class and money and supply and demand, right? But in this project, I need to go beyond that because my relationship to those intersections, you know, is different as sort of like a white privileged trans woman. There's only so much I can say with legitimacy without like, you know, speaking sort of like in ways that I shouldn't be. Um, so one of the larger pieces of, of, this, of this project is to take my account of reality enforcement and place it within a much broader account of oppression. And so the last part of the book is about placing my account of oppression into dialogue with Maria Lagones' notion of the colonial modern gender system and showing it to be an aspect of that. Um, and that's where we get into some of the deeper issues around personhood, self, and subject, because once we do that, we really need to start thinking through these broader issues. So hopefully I've enticed you, um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Talia. Um, we are now going to go to Zoom. And we're going to hear from Marquise Bay, who is Assistant Professor of African American Studies at Northwestern University. Their work focuses on Blackness and fugitivity, transness, and Black feminist theory. Bay's publishing record is not only extremely impressive, but impactful. And I know this because I regularly teach their work and see its effect on students. They are the author of Them Goon Rules, Fugitive Essays on Radical Black Feminism, published in 2019 with the University of Arizona Press, and Arco Blackness, Notes Towards a Black Anarchism, published in 2020 with AK Press, Black Trans Feminism, published in 2021 with Duke University Press, and System Failure, Essays on Blackness and Cisgender, published in 2022, also with Duke University Press. So we're excited to have Bay with us today. Hey, can we all hear me? Yes, no. Can we hear me? No, we can't hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear me. Okay, I, I'm assuming that we can hear me right now. So I'm just gonna keep talking. Uh, okay, cool. So thank you for, for this. This is, um first, I have like a couple, like two and a half preparatory remarks. Uh, the first one is I apologize deeply and sincerely for not being able to be there in person with you all. I, of all things, got summoned for jury duty, uh, and I was um, doing that on Monday and Tuesday. And believe me, I would have much preferred to be there with you all, talking about feminist philosophy, than at jury duty. So that was the whole thing. Uh, so apologize for not being there in person uh, with you all. Uh, and then the second thing I wanted to say is that I feel so, and I want to try to make it a point to say these things when I feel these things, I feel so incredibly humble and grateful uh, to be on a pan on this panel, this panel specifically talking about trans feminism with two people, scholars, thinkers, whose work I teach and reference constantly. I am just deeply, deeply giddy, I think is the word right now, to be in conversation uh, with both of you. So I'm just, I'm ecstatic right now. Uh, so I am, I was I was also going to try to say that, Tyler, you can have like five more minutes on because my talk is going to be around the 22 to 25 minutes. I could have had some of my, some of my, uh, but, um, um, but, um, but, go with, um, but, go with, but, go with, go with, Okay, so I am going to get started then, and um, I don't have a title for the talk, um, but as I was reading through this earlier this morning, I figured perhaps the title, and hopefully this will become clear later on, uh, but the title could be something like everything else, so I'll dive in. And I'm also just going to read too. I hope that's okay. I'm not nearly as equipped as Talia to just speak off the cuff, um, so I'm just going to read, and I hope that's okay. So, it seems nowadays I'm beginning each talk I give, whether conference talk, invited lecture, Zoom call, or what have you, 
It seems like they all keep opening with a story, some kind of timid offering of this or that context, this or that anecdote, this or that narrative that makes all the subsequent esoteric theorizing make some kind of sense. And on this occasion, it's no different. Indeed, it might take on that habit more fervently than talks past. And I hope that it's okay with all of you. This is a practice growing more pervasive for me, I think, because I've become more and more attuned to the non-origins or always multiply and maybe even infinite origins of the thoughts that meander around on the pages that I pen. Those non-origins are incredibly or ordinary, a childhood memory, a conversation via text, a chat or a thought during a walk, an exchange with the cashier. These are the moments, among other moments too, whether tethered to the proverbial ground or loftily philosophical, because both are, at least to me, necessary and valid and not hierarchized, despite many people's attempts to imbue the former with more validity. These non-origin moments are the moments when the Black feminism, the trans feminism, the Black and trans feminism through which I move bubble up. So, I, so my wandering thoughts this morning, uh, graced with the presence of all of you, will be nothing more really than storytelling. They are stories, I hope, that demonstrate the whys and where froms of the theorizing I've taken to doing. In short, I'm telling stories here about how I've come to understand blackness, transness, feminism, and more specifically, the intersection between all of them. These stories are not your average stories, but they are stories nonetheless that I think at least must be told. So part one. I begin over two, over two decades ago. Long have I been a shy kid, though not friendless. Indeed, I've long had more friends than I wanted. I've been wondering as of late if there was something to that, as I imagine that there was, and certainly now is, something that implies a certain reworking of where friendship might lie and in what friendship can be grounded. This is to say simply that my friends were a bit all over the place by which I mean, there was a way I moved with folks who often would not move with each other. White kids who introduced me to rock music and video games that someone like my brother wouldn't even consider. Hardcore dudes from Philly who smoked blunts while tucking Swisher sweets behind their ears for later. Punk rocker girls who dyed their hair weekly or nerds who almost to a T fit the stereotype of glasses and suspenders wearing nerds. There was something about all of them that resonated with me and something about me that resonated with them. I don't know what it was exactly, but I know it wasn't what was expected. And as of late, I've been thinking about how it is possible that that something was a kind of ineffability, an illegible disposition toward dissent, and a desire to escape confines and limitations placed upon with whom I could or was supposed to relate. That something might have a, might have been a certain rebellious spirit, as it were, small and minute as it might have been, that did not wish to abide the implicit and sometimes explicit mandates to adhere to spaces that were suffused with categorical imperatives. The categories little Marquise felt were insufficient, so that little kid moved between and beyond them as much as possible and moved sometimes perhaps most importantly and most dangerously, irrespective of them. And this was inflected in a number of ways. The supposed properness of clothing or dress or manner of physical gesture that signifies a fed upness with respectability or rock music that references a break from the austerity felt in white life or the fraternizing with those who understood drug use as a reference for a broad-based discontent or a different kind of intellectualism that meditates on the ills of the world. All of these things for me now inflect a thread of some kind of break or breach from normativity, from all those ways that we are told to do and be this, from all those moments that you, will, you are told you are not allowed to move or love or think in other ways. And it seems to me I've been forging relationality and indeed a sense of self on those grounds rather than other grounds understood as more proper. Because when one grows up like I did in and around Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, one cannot help but to think that what exists or rather what is said to exist is all that truly exists. 
one assumes that, yes, of course, we are here communing with these people because it is only natural, and that naturalness is imbued with what seemed like divine law. One assumes that you cannot and must not deviate from the tenets inscribed in the, among so many other things, racialized and gender identifications lashed onto you because you, of course, did not get to choose them. When one grows up like this, as I did, and when one moves also in ways unsanctioned, at least in this context, like I did, one begins to become a bit too curious because the barbershop banter and the unprovoked lecture from the five percenters on the corner and the myriad conversations and lectures I received from older kids about how to properly behave and schoolyard rules and requisites left me deeply unsatisfied. So I sought other ways to live. This very idea of the proper is what is breached. This idea of there being a specific way to inhabit the world, a particular and specific way to be and live and relate. The notion of the proper infuses itself in so many aspects of what it means to live and it deconstructs the very limits of what valid life entails, a validity that rests on racialized, gender and sexualized parameters. So what I wish to ask, and what I was asking back then through my friendships, is what if we did not adhere to, align with this notion of the proper? What if we in fact emerge onto the scene of relationality with others on grounds improper, grounds that in fact forsook the notions of whiteness, of cisness, of masculinity, of even humanity, all of which ground a proper relationality? What if we relate to ourselves and others, a capacious others that does not include, but radically refuses to exclude other living and non-living entities? This is how I enter the Black and trans feminism and the telling of its idea. So now part two, scene one. So the practice I've taken on with respect to gender identification, <clears throat> though such a term and the related term identity are terms I grow more and more uninterested in each day. And I can say more about that during Q&A and folks who are familiar with my work know perhaps why. It's to say, not that I am non-binary, but that I understand myself through non-binariness. This, I think, displaces the assumption that one assumes as a fundamental stitch of one's impenetrable being non-binariness or any other gender identification which carries with it a correct and valid and accurate way to wear and thus be deemed this specific thing and moves more toward understanding non-binariness as a political orientation with disrespect to gender that appears and disappears and flickers that is not quite about gender itself, but a discontented way of unrelating to the ravages of gender. That's how I'm understanding non-binariness. To move through or understand myself through non-binariness is to be offered gender constantly on the pendulous spectrum of the deeply conservative and divinely ordained binaristic to the seemingly ethical requisite to acknowledge gender privileges, which I'll speak to in a moment. To be offered this constantly and to say very simply and assuredly, no thank you. Scene two. I was sitting at a table on the patio of a lovely little restaurant in Dartmouth with a colleague and our new friend. During our walk, I shared a bit about the writing that I do, that my intellectual pursuits revolve primarily around Blackness, trans studies, and feminism. It was made clear that my political commitments were focused on gender non-normativity and the ease with which I used trans and they pronouns in the language endemic to treat queer and trans cultural productions attested to a level of dexterity with the topic. Our new friend, as we sat, shared her own scholarly pursuits, that of Asian American literature and cultural studies. Somehow, and I truly, truly do not remember how, my colleague, a white woman who brilliantly writes about indigenous and black speculative fictions, noted how her and I have had numerous conversations about the ethics and navigational attention of those like us who are presumed outside of the implicit demographics of the disciplines we take part in. But wait, our new friend said, are you not trans? This or something like this has happened to me over a dozen times now in counting being invited to give my personal story on Black trans identity or asked to participate in all trans panels leaves me with a deeply vexed feelings. 
Most of the time, I want to say something far too complex than the situation implicitly calls for. And sometimes I begin to launch into such a lecture, but oftentimes I cower and capitulate, unable to fully say what it is I must say to stop the assumption from occurring. Unable to say in not so many words, yes, but no. Not the kind of trans you likely think, which is likely the only kind of trans you think there is. There is another way. There are other ways to do and be trans, and I roam there. Scene three. I was in conversation with a friend, also non-binary, about the effects of refusing gender when gender is even well-meaningly imposed. I was asked about the thorniness of the kinds of thoughts I live by, essentially idealistic, utopian, future-oriented, and how they relate to the deep imperfection of what we have now. What happens, in other words, when what I desire and what is are in antagonistic relationship? I shared, of course, a story. When I show up to the meetings for social justice doers with the many ways that my body presents itself, despite my non-binariness and refusal of gender normativity's hold over me, there is a discourse present that demands I not only reckon with, but accept and reiterate male or masculine privilege as an ethical gesture. They say that someone who looks like I do must acknowledge the reality of how my body accrues benefits bestowed by patriarchy. And if I don't acknowledge this, I wrongly try to rebuke the privileges I undoubtedly, unceasingly, always and forever have. I fail to check my privilege. I know I think what they mean, and I know the kinds of politics and discourses from which they draw, and I feel deeply and intimately empathetic. And I am nothing if not my grandmother's grandchild, always deferential and humble in the face of these things, seen yet not heard. It seems too often, though, that the requisite to acknowledge and check is in fact a requisite to content myself with the existing order as if it is natural, as if nothing can or should be done about it. It seems often that they want me to be a man, that I can only ever, in the absence of the non-existing graces of hegemony, truly be a man. And how cruel is that? How violent to me and others? In a sly undermining of the political valence and intention of non-binariness, that is, to subvert, interrogate, and displace the assumption that a body means something a priori, and that gender can be assumed by making recourse to the corporeal surface. This is something I get from the work of C. Riley Snorton. I am called to deem myself and make myself, over and over, a legible man in a perverse commitment to gendered ethics. This, in my non-binariness, is me living on another terrain, fiercely and committedly, yet others demanding that I live on their terrain. I just want to live elsewhere, yet right here, which then makes me think of something that Hortense Spillers has said. Now, Hortense Spillers is all the rage in Black studies and Black feminist theory, and I quite honestly am exhausted with the ways that her work which is in fact not her work in its entirety, but one essay from 1987, but we can talk more about that later, the ways that Hortense Miller's work has been taken up. But I find her incredibly prescient in a number of other ways. And one of those ways is from a 2007 conversation she had about that 1987 essay. So Hortense Spiller said, and I'm quoting here, the refusal of certain gender privileges to black women historically was a part of the problem. At the same time, you have to sort of see that and get beyond it to get to something else because you are trying to go through gender to get to something wider, unquote. That's Hortense Bills. To get more directly to the point, yes, absolutely. Identities of those who are queer or trans or black or non-binary are and can be very useful, can be affirming in so many ways. And yes, these identities, can be used in service of combating cis patriarchy and white supremacy as history has shown. That is not, and I don't think can ever be disputed. For me, I'm simply not interested in stopping there as it seems many others are. I wish, as Spiller seemed to suggest, to go through those identities to get to something wider. Perhaps, and I'll admit this, perhaps I rush too zealously to the wider bypassing things that others do not think are settled yet. But I am zealous 
only because I'm giddy about all those other things we might be and might have been were it not for these clunky colonial bestowals we have come to call our skins and bodies. I want to get to those wider things because that to me is what we deserve. And that to me is the trans. All these ways that gender is refused in service of something that allows us to reconfigure what trans can allow to emerge, to think in a way that expands the capacity of trans to hold so much more than it is believed to be able to hold. That trans, far from being simply a name for moving from one gender to the quote unquote other gender, references something more, a tinkering and fracturing of gender itself as a coherent, seamless, regime imposed as an apparatus of capture, a politicized misalignment with gender, with normativity writ large, an interrogation of non-consensual impositions of paltry option bestowed upon us before we even show up in the world, a fed upness with gender itself as a necessity for relating to others. And I'm reminded here actually of um, a moment that Judith Butler has noted in which Butler looking like Judith Butler does, was staying at a hotel and then someone knocked on the door. One of the hotel workers needed access to the room. And then when Judith Butler opens the door, the hotel worker uh, stutters and says, Mr. Madam, Mr. Madam. And then Judith Butler says, do you really need to know my gender in order to enter the room? Those ways that gender is this kind of social lubricant uh, that disallows interaction until gender is placed. What would, a, what a trans that references the vitiation of this stuff, that references this capacity, what would that entail? What kind of rethinking would we have to undergo if that were taken brutally, terrifyingly seriously? It is this kind of trans that is embedded in the idea of Black and trans feminism, a trans that does not wish to align with gendered mandates and regimes a trans that misaligns, that runs from the side of the binary deemed proper to you, and that runs from the sides altogether. Because what happens when we do not run back to the side we've been told and made to stay on? What happens when we rebuke in infinite ways the ways they've lashed a specific address onto us, onto our documentation and IDs? But frankly, if I'm being honest, it is not even about the address on one's ID, the address they said would never change, and the address that must define you. Because how many times have we, say, gone to the DMD, presented our documents, coercive and surveilling documents, been asked if the written address is still correct, and said no? Sometimes we feel ashamed, but how joyous is the feeling of having moved somewhere else? to somewhere unsanctioned by the regulative mandates of too rigid identification documents. It's that joyfulness in the moving elsewhere that I'm after. Because really, we are and must always be moving. That ID says I live there at that address, an address on their grid. But really, I am not always there. Right now, I'm here at this DMV. Sometimes I'm in my car, on the road, which is where I might feel most comfortable. Sometimes I stay with a buddy for a week, crashing on the couch, eating Pringles while binge watching reruns of The Office. Sometimes I am at work or on campus or at the store or running errands. And yes, sometimes I'm at the address on my ID, but I'm in this room, then that room. Sometimes I am in the shower or in bed. Sometimes it is dirty or clean. And sometimes the aroma lingers from the feast I prepared. And sometimes I have guests over, some of whom stay the night and some of whom forgot their bags, which go into my closet for years. Is that the same address? It is not then that I want the address on my ID to match where I am because I'm always elsewhere and I want to be elsewhere, unable to be addressed. This is my trans, a running ceaselessly away from the address that they put on my ID. All of this brings me finally to the ends of my Black and trans feminism. It bears making explicit that feminism does not belong to a particular kind of gendered person. Feminism is not about empowering certain kinds of people to inhabit the structures already in place, often white supremacist and capitalist and cis normative structures. Feminism, to put it briefly before expanding just a little bit, is a way of orienting or disorienting to hegemonic power in subversive ways 
That is, inasmuch as power is facilitated by gender subordination and circumscription, feminism for us here marks a liberatory and anti-captivity project, not interested in repackaging harmful modalities of gender or hierarchy. It is interested instead in wholesale eradication of violence, whether interpersonal or ontological, we might say, and in imagining other modalities of life. We can then deem this a kind of Black and trans feminism, which is beholden to no strictly delimited demographic, bearing no strict criteria for entrance, always expressive of an openness to anyone and everyone committed to doing its work, precisely because this is what Jennifer Nash would deem an anti-captivity project. So to conclude, part three. As an anti-captivity project, Black and trans feminism are concerned with imagining otherwise. This is a phrase I've come to use constantly, the otherwise. While captivity connotes violent grips confining our flourishing, perhaps in thinking of a movement away from captivity that is not toward, but facilitated in its movement by an embrace, perhaps an impossible embrace without arms, an embrace without being bounded, a bear hug by arms that never close, we gain a different understanding of that toward which we aspire. The work of Black and trans feminism is always an aim for the creative dimension of a certain kind of abolition in the world that arise because of the undermined hegemonic categories. Indeed, we are various shades of brokenness and lack, and I wish not to venerate this plight. We need to be healed and do not wish to remain writhing in our broken pieces. We need, in other words, to be held. But what I wish for, what my Black and trans feminism might wish for, is the reconfiguration of how we hold each other without stopping and without withholding, all while on the run. And of course, all of this will be scary. There is thus a different image of the world after the world I wish to posit, because I wish to take the scariness seriously. So to conclude, I'm moving forward in my talk. So to bring this to a close, it may not be about erecting something at all. It may be much more fruitful and interesting, I think, to think of how we can come to something like what we might have been through this pervasive, what we might be called Black and trans feminism, through, as it were, a project not of putting things together, but of viewing with soft eyes, feeling with humble breath, the gloriousness of how things fall apart. And the shards lying there is a mosaic of pieces you can pick up and carry with you, fondling it in your hands, tucking it in your pocket, only to discard it later. Or you can stomp on the shards, grinding them into smaller pieces, awing at their disintegration, or further still, you can step over the pile, walking into the sunset. And I want to give one concluding story uh, to kind of illustrate what or rather where I find myself, at least right now. So I was at a talk uh, and I had someone ask me to my face, if we give up all of this in the ways that you are talking about, in the face of all that black people and queer people and trans people and women have lost, this is what this person said to me, having no claim to anything, what do we have left? And I answered, to that person's face as, sincere, as sincerely and effectively and ethically as I could. We have everything else. And that'll conclude my talk. Thank you all. Phenomenal gender, what trans, no gender, gender what trans, no gender. Wow. <laughs> Let's try that again. Great. <laughs> the author of Phenomenal Gender, What Transgender Experience Discloses, published in 2017 with Indiana University Press. It's a great book. In it, he offers a compelling account of what gender is through an examination of the interplay between the operation of power on individuals and the persistence of transgressive individuals who operate 
on institutions of power. Hello. You're going to be thrilled to find out that I am not, in fact, singing. <laughs> if Talia really expected me to sing, I would have had time to warm up. Hello from outside the academy. I am honored to have been invited to speak in such brilliant, supportive, and creative company. Thank you, Hypatia, for hosting us, for your decades of success, for surviving a hostile world for 40 years and making us all better scholars and people for your being here. The title of my paper is Moral Panics I Have Known, Trans Feminism, and I Can't Believe We Still Have to Protest This Bullshit. The sections of this paper are Alex's Venomous Spiders, Pop Goes the Threshold, We Can't Theory Ourselves Out of a Moral Panic, first section. Last month, I read a tweet by Fold Up Alex that says, when the moral panic about transgender people first started gaining momentum, I would explain to people that although it was unpleasant and stressful, it was important for me to keep track of the anti-trans campaign because it was like a venomous spider on the wall. That although staring at the venomous spider was scary and unpleasant, if I looked away, it could move and I'd lose track of it. Then I'd be in a room with a venomous spider and not know where it is. And that's far, far more scary and stressful. Reading the endless ways anti-trans campaigners were working to ruin the lives of my friends and I was incredibly draining, but I'd rather do that and keep track of their efforts, rhetoric and growth then look away and find out where the spider is by suddenly getting bitten. For those who are unaware, trans people's human and civil rights are under attack in the US, Canada, and the UK. The moral panic driving anti-trans sentiment has been growing for a while, but has hit an upswell. In the US, journalist Aaron Reed has been documenting the rise in anti-trans legislation and explaining it as we go. Hundreds of bills targeting trans health care and participation in public life have been presented in various states. Maggie Astor reports in the New York Times, many bills contain nearly identical language suggesting a common template. The same reporter notes that the same detransitioned anti-trans activists are flown to state capitals to lobby for these bills because so very few who transition regret doing so. The federal government is also affected. National anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ amendments have been added to must pass bills, and this will require close scrutiny in the upcoming legislative session. Lurid accusations of grooming children and performing unnecessary surgeries on minors abound in the media, mostly social media, but untruths, half-truths, and distortions are being repeated unchallenged in legitimate news outlets as well. In February, 1,200 New York Times contributors signed a letter asking the paper to correct its current trend of following quote, far-right hate groups in presenting gender diversity as a new controversy warranting new punitive legislation. Some articles that raise concerns about gender-affirming medical practices do not involve any trans people or experts in gender-affirming medical care at all. Others blatantly misrepresent the stories of those with whom they do speak betraying people who think they are speaking up for themselves. None of this is new. The Red Scare, Satanic Panic, The War on Drugs, Banning Pit Bulls, and QAnon are all examples of moral panic. Public anxiety coalesces around a group and facts be damned as stochastic violence takes over and takeover it does, 
anti-LGBTQ violence is on the rise in the same countries where rights are under attack. To combat this, it helps to learn what we can do about the venomous spiders. And that's where scholarly feminism comes in, believe it or not. First, I want to describe the way I think this coalescence of violence occurs and then note connections, venomous spiders that warrant close attention. Pop goes the threshold. Stochastic violence is a condition of collective behavior creating conditions in which violence percolate, percolates throughout the population and occasionally one of us snaps, just when the conditions are right. The more anxiety heats a population up internally against members of the same population, the more violent incidents we can expect to see. The more violent incidents we see, the more normalized violent incidents become and the more anxiety heats the population up. Rinse, repeat. An intersectional approach to human experience holds that each of us dwells at all times as a point of intersection within a context of numerous social constructions, age, race, class, sex, gender, sex, ability, education, and so on. No social construction operates in a vacuum. They are always experienced in concert as overlapping epistemic commonalities. Furthermore, any cultural medium of intelligibility is shared among those with differing perspectives. A family is lived differently by children than by parents, for instance. The factical condition of occupying different places in a social group necessitates different perspectives. There are good reasons that people have different perspectives, and these perspectives drive action, behavior, and valuing. They literally shape life itself, and at times an understanding of others' perspectives is crucial to informing one's own. When a community is affected by disruptive events, the disruption reverberates throughout many of the intersections its members experience. The Black Lives Matter movement, for instance, was founded by Black, queer women, members of at least three social groups commonly exposed to violence. The violence perpetrated against Black people in this country occurs in concert with violence against women and queer people. The hope of BLM, one of them, is when one group is empowered, others will be as well. Reverberation works in all directions. This is great when we build deliberate social movements composed of willing, consenting, and rational actors who turn their efforts to responsible social change. We don't generally experience disruption willingly and deliberately, however. The world is shared. It is not usually under deliberate control of those who dwell within it. Change is that, that is not chosen or consented to fosters anxiety at the encroachments of the unheimlich, the uncanny. Since 2001, when America got shocked and hurt, we have been chasing a sense of security. As anxiety rises, security rhetoric and security theater replace actual security and feed the public's dread. In order to maintain our warm, fuzzy feelings of safety, reinforced by triumphs of security over the amorphous threat, we have to keep the threats coming. So we have something to thwart. So we have something to reign victorious over. I'll spare you the recitation of Plato's Book of the Tyrant. We've all read it. Rinse, repeat. The zeitgeist this fosters is tense. The possibilities for being in our time emphasize possibilities for being terrorized. The norms and trends that arise do so in the shadow of our anxiety. And how do norms and trends catch on? Mark Granovetter described this back in 1978. Norms and motives exist in any group setting, which is pretty obvious. Still, there are cases where ideas and trends seem to catch on to spread in a viral fashion. This is not rare. Fashion trends. Um, fashion trends behave in exactly this way, along with teenage slang, running collective jokes, striking workers, go WGA, and the like. At times, people participate in these trends even at the cost of their own well-being. What it takes for people to participate in these sorts of group action is that a threshold has to be met. Some people are more inclined to perform action X, let's say dance at a party. 
Most will only be inclined to dance if at least one other person is already dancing. Some will not dance until the floor is full. Still others will never be dragged to the dance floor. As more people take to the floor, the more people's thresholds are met, and thus are there more dancers. Add to this the fact that no threshold is utterly stable or absolute. Conditions can change thresholds, and we can see how a trend catches on. The benign trend becomes obvious, ominous when it's not dancing, but the reinscription of rhetoric and actions that lower thresholds for violence against some members of the community. At any point, every single one of us is composed of countless intersecting matrices, all of which bear multiple possibilities for action. Heidegger calls it das Mann in Mitzayim. Foucault calls it power. Butler calls it social construction. All are describing aspects of the social body in which a trend catches on. When social constructions exert power upon those of us whose Zion is tied up mit one another, the norms and trends sh uh, shape us as individuals. At the same time, the needs and concerns of individuals shape the technologies of power that operate upon us. The thresholds that must be met for us to assert our own needs are dizzyingly complex calculations of motivation that each of us performs all the time from where we stand in our own situatedness. Whether a school shooting or a dance, the perspective engendered by the unique life world of any one of us is a shifting series of thresholds. Add to this that we don't always calculate well or choose wisely and the complexity increases even more. One weakness with Granovitter's threshold theory is that this sociological model discusses rational actors with complete information. But in the real world, nobody has complete information and we do not make choices according to reason alone. This means that at any given moment, every single one of us is engaged in balancing our life's aims with our fears and anxieties. The more options we have to act, the more free we are to choose options that promote thriving. But when perceived options are narrowed, as they are when anxiety rises, the stakes go up and anxiety further avoids dizzying options and thus freedom. Uniformity is celebrated. Difference, ambiguity, and uncertainty are not tolerated. Truth is simply not always relevant when this happens. When lies about a minority group are retold often enough, the truth of the matter becomes irrelevant to some agents. The story supports the cultural narrative of groomers, and even many who know it is a lie believe it in spite of their knowledge, as a matter of faith rather than fact. The need that asserts itself is the need to keep the threats coming, so they have something to thwart so they have something to reign victorious over. Rinse, repeat. This is how thresholds lower and the likelihood of violence arises. This is how cruelty becomes the point. We can't theory ourselves out of a moral panic. What do gender affirming medical care and reproductive medical care have in common, if not bodily autonomy? Moira Donegan lays out the case clearly in The Guardian, but the gist of the argument has been clear for a while. Attacks on trans people's human and civil rights ramped up just around the time of the Dobbs decision that overturned Roe and for the first time in U.S. history removed a constitutional right from Americans. Anti-trans movements in the U.K. and Canada have been following the U.S. lead, but with similar political motivations and take a look at the funding. Sure, it's clear that right-wing extremists enjoy hurting trans people, but hurting us isn't the point. Codifying a broad range of attacks on bodily autonomy is. Normalizing the denial of medical care is. Touting a right to same-sex spaces as a pseudo-feminist excuse for discrimination based on biological sex is. Not all women's movements are feminist movements. 
It is no coincidence that this has been happening in tandem with unprecedented multiple indictments of a former president, brazen promotion of white supremacy, attacks on education, the accelerated concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, and relaxing of labor protections. Legislative attacks on bodily autonomy, this time the ginning up of yet another anti-LGBTQ moral panic, has been eroding the threshold of national violence in general. And feminism exists to counter the violence of patriarchy. Hopefully in ways that don't repeat the mistakes of patriarchy, we try. There are many feminisms, as we're all very well aware. For a lot of trans people in the US, UK, and Canada right now, feminism is trying to find competent medical care or navigating vitriol in the workplace and online, keeping in mind that online is often the workplace. Academic trans feminism has given us a lot. The vocabularies to build the trends or social constructions that create the global communities we need to survive. Academic trans feminism has given us the perspectives we need to strategize together for our survival. Academic trans feminism has given us the squabbling and the arguments through which we discover truth and we discover the ways that we are going to move forward. And I think the squabbling is key. We have to do it. This too is power. This is shaping the technologies of power that operate on us. We're not pawns. We're agents navigating within a complex whole and having the words for who we are and what we experience is what makes that possible. It's new. Trans people have always existed. Wide reaching trans communities have not. We have, we have each other in a new way. We can't theory ourselves out of a moral panic, but we are better informed, more well-connected, and have more allies than ever before. Trans thriving is feminist power. Okay, we have um, about 40 minutes for questions, which is an abundance of time. Um, and is there a mic for the audience? Yeah, I'll, I'll be running mic. Great. So um, if you could just um, raise your hand and I'll try to keep a track and we'll go. Um, so Andrea, all the way in the back is where we'll begin. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea. Um, thank you so much for this panel. It was fantastic. Um, I think my question is kind of stemming from Talia's talk, but I hope I think resonates with each of the panelists. Um, and I would be excited to hear your responses uh, from I'm excited to hear responses from everyone. Um, in particular, I was um, I really appreciate Talia, your bringing out of this conception of intimacy, not only with respect to violations of intimacy, with respect to reality enforcement, but also um, I'm curious about the role of intimacy in um, forms of resistance and kind of intimacy um, in, um, in embodied uh, uh, or resistance through embodied intimacy, I suppose. Um, and I was uh, really struck by um, several examples from the talks. Um, and Das, I'll have to apologize. I, I missed a bit of yours, but even the the, the the discussion of the dance floor and the threshold um, also is, I mean, a way of thinking about relations of intimacy and embodied intimacy, um, spoken also myself as someone who's a dancer and who loves to dance. Um, but also, um, uh, Marquise, um, there's so much in the storytelling, especially um, with respect to friendships that you used to preface your remarks about uh, listening to a song with friends or to uh, holding someone's belongings in your closet for so long um, that it's re really there's a, so much about it, embodied relations of intimacy in, in the words that you've offered today. So I guess I would just open a question for for questions of uh, intimacy beyond violence um, uh, for each of you, um, and just uh, I would welcome your your thoughts on that. Thank you. 
thanks so much for the question. It's a great question. Um, and certainly this is a big part of the book that I'm that I'm working on. And I want to give a couple or certainly an example of what I'll call complex intimacy. And here I'm really, you know, getting some of this stuff from thinking about the relationship between intimacy and, uh, you know, the complex emotions that Maria Lagones talks about, like in hard to ha handle anger, and, um, complex communication and the like. But so here's a trans experience, you know, I think of um, a, a vulnerability um, and also sort of the possibility of a kind of um, violence, but then with that also a kind of special kind of intimacy. I'm just using trans as an example. So like when you open up to someone in a relationship, right? It could be a friendship, could be, right? And you start, you know, you say that you're trans. Or you, and one of the things that you're aware of is that in opening up, you're vulnerable to multiple interpretations. So like even your body, right? So what does your body mean? What kind of moral boundaries does it have, right? You know, um, and you don't know how the other person is going to receive it. So you're sort of open to a couple of different ways this can go when one can be profoundly inv invalidating and another not. But to be really got, like, you know, think about intimacy when you open yourself up and you get got by the other person, right? The person gets it because they get it that they get this complex vulnerability. They get that what's going on is a vulnerability that, you know, is multi-systemic that, that are, are multi-worldly, if you will. And in order to be fully got, you need that kind of multi-worldly reception. Does that make sense? And so I think that certainly the kind of intimacy that I have in mind must be sort of multi-worldly in that sense. Um, and also let me know that there's a kind of weird thing that goes on here, which is if if you're not got, if if sort of your complex vulnerability is shut down and you're subject to sort of, you know, a form of abuse, there is what I call um, infra intimacy. That is in the lack of understanding, in the ignorance and obliviousness of the other person, you do have a protection, right? You were never fully vulnerable after all in that way. And so there's a way in which a certain kind of unintelligibility can protect you. Um, I think that uh, and another, and I'll just stop here. I think that, you know, in my view, intimacy is often organized by complex systems, you know, in, in a certain way, you know, drawing on what Marquise talks about is the proper, right? So there's a whole system that we must follow. And one of the things that you know you see, for example, in in, in, in trans community contexts, is ways in which you're kind of building intimacy on the fly, um, often by trading on possibilities of inf inf intimacy, but creating new boundaries, creating new gestures of intimacy, and part of the intimacy derives precisely from that creative force. Um, and so I would also say that I think that this capacity to create or lay down new boundaries um, and new gestures of intimacy is part of this sort of, you know, um, positive aspect that you were talking about, Andrea. Um, I'm just riffing here, so. <laughs> Don't necessarily take this as gospel or anything like that. Um, but I am struck by the sense of community that we have, the the kinds of ways that we have of being in community with one another that have sometimes not existed in the past. And I, of course, being you know, contentious philosopher, I want to go back at you with there's even a kind of intimacy and contention. And I'm thinking about a lot of, as I mentioned, squabbles before. Um we squabble with each other a lot. We argue with each other. We get so tired of each other. And oh my God, these teenagers, can you believe what they've been saying this time? And all that is a kind of intimacy that I think we sometimes undervalue because that's often the site where we forge our community. Uh, we often, there's this strange intimacy that comes up and I think we're all familiar with it, 
but I don't know that anybody's really done any work with it. When you're intimate with people you don't like in your community, but you know, those of us who were raised in a church might have a particular person in mind. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but you're still in community and still in common goal with these people. And I think that those are some of our areas, areas of greatest strength that we perhaps underutilize. Can I, can I speak uh, to this as well? Um, I, lo I love this question of intimacy um, because... Um, we can't hear you. Okay, try now. How about now? Good, okay. Um, so yeah, I love this question of intimacy um, because it's a tough one for me. Tough in the sense that, uh, you, can, you can ask my partner, I'm, I'm not the most, how do I want to put this? That doesn't make me sound like an asshole because uh, I'm not, I'm not, I promise. But I'm not, so when I hear the word intimacy, I immediately think of a kind of physical proximity, physical proximity, and I don't want to be around people usually, uh, but nevertheless, I still love a sense of intimacy. I still have these moments where I feel deeply close, but not physically proximate to, to others. So like a, a friend of mine, a friend of mine, we were on the phone like two days ago or something like that. And they're on the job market and all that kind of stuff, but they didn't call me because they're on the job market. They called me and they said, I just wanted to hear your voice. Uh, or, or even like the, and I kind of alluded to this phenomenon in my, in my remarks, uh, but uh, a friend of my partner and my uh, her, her earrings and her one sock is still just like in our guest room and it's just sitting there, just sitting there and we have not moved yet. It's been a year and a half and we haven't moved it, but there have been three occasions where we've seen the sock or we've seen the earring and then we call up Lore and just talk to her. Uh, so like these moments of intimacy that are not about physical proximity feel very, resonate very deeply with me because I'm someone who doesn't like to be around people. I yearn for ways to be intimate that do not necessitate being close physically to someone. And I think that's important too. I really think that's important. Uh, and I think that allows for perhaps, perhaps even more, because I imagine I'm not the only one who feels that way. I imagine that will allow for more intimacy with other kinds of people who experience and enact intimacy in other kinds of ways. Uh, so it's deeply important to me, but in ways that don't quite look like a certain kind of physical intimacy. And I want to, I want to expand those kinds of, those kinds of practices of intimacy. I think right in the back, there's a question and then we'll come over to the side. Yeah, I thought I'd just follow up um, with Talia as well because I had a question sort of about the same range of issues as Andrea was talking about. Um, so I was just struck by your, um, this idea of playing along. Um, and I thought it was just a really like a rich site for for um, a, lot of a lot of different issues seem to come alive at that site. So I can imagine, for instance, you know, someone would, would be theoretically affirming and um, committed in principle to the affirmation of trans people and trans company and relationships and friendships and so on. And then at the level of, of the body, the body might not cooperate, right? The body's, the desire of the person might not be in line with their theoretical commitments. And just this, this, this difficulty of of a kind of universal the universal's relation to the specific or the the category versus you know the category of this theoretical affirmation versus the feeling the experience in one's body um of the body's unwillingness to go along let's say or you know maybe a person like that would be you know wanting to do it so that eventually they believe it or feel it, right? So there, so there's a kind of you know it, orientation maybe toward habituation. If I get in the habit of being around trans people, then maybe maybe I'll feel it completely. So there, there's a sort of interesting um, relationship, I guess, between the the theoretical and the experiential, um, and then also the the vulnerability that we have because 
you know, you were talking at the beginning of your talk about how you're trying, you know, challenging the issue of self and subjectivity and so on. And I think that this issue of, of desire and of bodily relation um, and of intimacy really um, shows how much we're at the mercy in some sense of other people and our sense of who we are and our sense of um, our own value and our, and, and of, and how, who we are is really kind of dependent on things like their bodies, right? Their desire um, sometimes. And, and it really sort of undermines this idea that we're, we're sort of doing ourselves on our own. Um, and I was thinking in relation to that issue about Amiya Srinivasan's discussion of the, the politics of your desire, you know, um, and how in some sense, because, because of our vulnerability to each other, desire is a really powerful place at which we we enact our affirmation. And it's, you know, it's an, it's kind of inevitable and it's something that we have to grapple with, I think. So so for those reasons, I thought that was a really rich example. And uh, I wonder what you, you know, I, I look forward to seeing what you develop in it. Uh, thank you for that. There's it's a very rich um, question, obviously, and I don't think that I can address all of it. I mean, for me, the relationship between theory and actual experience and practice you know, practice is always, almost always there, you know, and so for me, this experience of relationships with people that end up being about playing along, I mean, that's, I mean, that's built on my personal experience, you know, with um, non-trans people, um, and sort of how it always seems that they turn at some point, and it is revealed that what I thought the relationship was, it is not. Um, and, you know, I do think that it sort of gets to, um, I would not just say just desire, because I think that if you think more broadly about sort of infect, effective investments in intimacy, right, I mean, I think that there is sort of a lot of, there's a rich uh, ways in which you might characterize those those sentiments, those effective investments, like if you think like uh, um vulnerability, the experience of vulnerability, ways in which we experience vulnerability, ways in which it can be good or bad, right? Um, ways in which those are are gendered, if you will, in, in terms of our responses, but also ways in which we feel secure through a kind of distance, right? That might be described as a kind of sense of dignity. I dislike this word because I think it's specific and got baggage, but you know, sometimes poise or self-collection or what have you. Um, I, lots of different feelings like that. And I do think that it's not that, you know, we're in control of those sorts of things. You know, it, often we're not. Often that requires adjustments, changes, habituations. And I think that does go to show that, you know, it, one of my points is that it's not just about sort of like by fiat, we're going to change the pronouns or learn to get the pronouns right. That what is going on is so much, you know, deeper than that. Um, and much more difficult, you know, challenging different ways of relating of relating to each other. I will say though that sometimes it is used in a way that doesn't necessarily that is hypocritic in terms of the um, there's a kind of hypocrisy in some of this stuff. So let me give an example, right? It is um, a fact that many. Many trans women know that there are like non-trans straight guys who will have sex with you behind closed doors. They just don't want their friends to find out. Or if their friends are in on it, then it's fine too. But other people, right? So you want to keep it a secret. And this is really interesting because of, instead of being restricted to the public and having an intimacy foreclosed, you have the intimacy, but then you have the sort of public recognition foreclosed, right? Um, and it's not then because there isn't an attraction. Um, it's because of sort of, you know, this a sense of like what, what your friends are going to think, the social costs of being found out and ways in which this attraction that you have for this trans woman is going to be represented as homosexual in the dominant world, right? Which is a little bit interesting because, you know, if you're attracted to this particular shape, and, you know, ways, you know, you might say, well, that's just the same kind of attraction, regardless of how you cut it. Why, so why are you calling it gay in this, in this you know? Um, so there's a kind of hypocrisy there. And it's interesting, you see a similar hypocrisy 
in the case of sex segregation. And this was really interesting. It sort of came out to me um, in my back and forth with Kathleen Stock, you know, several years ago. Um, you know, we don't want trans women in these sort of like female only spaces, right? And um, because this is going to be horrible, right? Even. And then, you know, I sort of pressed the point about like, you know, well, what, what the, you never think about like trans mask individuals for, you never think about trans men, right? Never. And her sort of thought was, well, I'd be totally fine with um, trans mask individuals in female space. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Have you ever met a trans mask individual? Are you serious? You know, and I have trans... <laughs> And friends of mine who are like, yeah, if I was forced into the women's restroom, you can rest assured I'd be like jeering and making crude comments just as a form of like resistance. And it's like, have you done the math on this? Do you understand the effects of testosterone? What are you talking about? Um, so, I mean, I do think that part of it is like desires that can't be controlled. But I also think that sometimes it's sort of very cynical deployments. Um, right. Anyway. That's what I have to say for now. Uh, hi, uh, I'm. Can you hear me through the mask? Okay. Um, I'm Naomi, and so many thoughts swirling around, um, including uh, the reason why I'm sitting over there and wearing a mask, is before I came here, I was visiting a very, very dear old friend who now has dementia and is living in memory care in Tacoma. And we both tested negative, but it's a relationship of some intimacy. And that was an important part of being with her. And after I left, she tested positive. So I'm, I hope still negative, but I've been exposed and exposed because of the shared need for kind of intimacy. But thank you, Marquis, for um, now I'm, I live in Boston, I'm going back and it's going to be the telephone. And thank you for pointing out that that is a mode of intimacy. Um, as an elderly, cishet, analytically trained philosopher, um, I have learned so much from um, trans philosophers and trans non-philosophers and also people dealing with um, race and racism, in particular black feminists. And in particular, what it's helped me learn is the, the value of what I call discombobulation and moving away from common sense. Uh, from, um, I loved your, I take it, intentionally playful Marquis use of the categorical imperative as the imperatives that attach to distinctive categories. And one of the things that that does is this general thing that I think is happening, which it queers the Kantian categorical imperative by making it an imperative attached to a particular category that refuses to name itself as a particular category and claims for itself the generic universal. So I love that twist on it. And so then thinking about what came up in, in all of your talks, the, the importance of categories. And um, like Talia, I have learned so much and I'm so indebted to uh, the work of Mary Logones and thinking about, um, I mean, as you were saying, Marquise, what's left once we've done away with this and this and this with the categorical imperatives, and you said everything else. And I take it that that partly is an invitation to be playful with our categories, that they're not an attempt to get even better at this creepy, creepy, horrible mainstream philosophical term, carving nature at its joints. Um, that we're playing with categories in a liberatory way and playing with each other in our use of categories. And so for me, um, that means that I don't get to be unremarkably normal, that cis is one way of inhabiting being a woman in the world. 
And that gets to the intimacy of sex. I'm wondering about thinking in terms of what we learned from um, various kink communities and thinking of what I call PV, which is penis and vagina intercourse, as a particular kink. And that people can turn out to be not sexually compatible if they don't share kinks. And if one has a kink for PV, then that's going to be part of what goes on. But one of the things about that is that I take it that kinks can become problematic if they become the only way one can take intimate bodily pleasure with another person. And so if one discovers there's that particular incompatibility, that is for whatever reason, that's not going to happen. And it's somebody that you're otherwise attracted to and want to be intimate with. The question is what playfully other things can we do and find a way of being physically intimate that doesn't involve that. But I think in terms of the question of the, the, the revelation of the problem, the, the body not going along that occurs at a certain point of intimacy, would it help if that were framed in terms of, well, I've got this particular kink for PV and we're not gonna be able to do that. And that might or might not be a problem depending on what else we can figure out to do with each other. Um, so this idea of queering, I mean, and, and for philosophically, instead of being the one to clean up the mess and provide conceptual clarity and get the concepts right, what if our job as philosophers was to live with the mess and help ourselves and each other to be responsible with the mess and recognize that, I mean, I'm a bit Kinshinian, so if, you know, if our concepts are what they do or what we do with them, we do lots and lots of different things. And part of what some of us are doing is trying to mess it all up. And that's important. And so if we were able as philosophers to let go of the job description of clean up your categories, get them right, hard nature at the joints, you know, let go of that and be playful and messy. So I'm wondering, I mean, in particular, getting back to the, you know, PV as king. Is that a way of non-oppressively dealing with a sense of this body isn't what I expected and maybe the kids don't get? I, I think that's interesting. And I don't have like an outright like, no, I don't think that we should go that way. I, I like the way that it sort of like um, it takes a certain form of sexuality and places it amongst a, a bunch of others. And I do in general think that sexuality you know, is far more complicated. I mean, and I think that's what a lot of the fetish communities show, right? That even this notion of orientation to a particular, right, object, let's say, um, is an inadequate description of of sexuality. So if you think, for example, in a, in a BDSM context, right, or say a submissive dom context, you know, the, what you're attracted to is very clearly a certain sort of relationality, right? I remember back in the day, Pat Califia once remarked that, you know, and this was before they had transitioned that, you know, um, and so we're identifying as lesbian, but that if they're on a, a desert island, they would much rather be with like a male who was a bottom than, than like, you know, a, a woman who was, who was, who was not a bottom. And so anyway, so the point is, yes, I think there's a great variety of forms of eroticism and, you know, a grave injustice incurs when we, you know, so you're kind of like putting a certain sort of sexuality in its place. And I think that it's also true that um, very often we're not in charge of like what turns us on in this sense. Like for some people, you, you have sort of maybe more latitude, but a lot of us, you know, is kind of like this range, an erotic range of what your thing is, you know, and I think that it is the case that, you know, so framing this, like, you know, it's just as an incompatibility because we've got different, like, you know, uh, different erotic, different sorts of eroticisms that work. Um, I will say, though, I do think that there are um, 
um, it's not just being uh, restricted to a particular fetish. I think that we can also worry about the erotic content of some fetishes, right? So if you have like a fetish that trades on racist stereotypes, right? I think we do, you should be concerned about that. I'm not saying we should break the person who has it because like you don't like choose to have it, but nonetheless, it should be an object of concern. And so if it turns out that, you know, you, the reason you don't erotically resonate to a trans person that, that, that this has, as it were, transphobic content. Here's an example of what, you know, so like often you'll get sort of like those uh, non, non-trans guys typically self-identified as straight who want to be with um, trans women, um, but their eroticism is like a chick with a dick. And what they mean is sort of like, you know, a non-trans female body with a penis, right? Um, you might start analyzing that specific erotic content and going, gee, that's like problematic from like, say, a trans political or trans moral point of view for reasons X, Y, and Z. Does that make sense? Okay. I can't believe I'm doing this at a philosophy conference, but there are communities that are engaged in this, um, engaged in proliferating the categories that are used to describe and talk about sexuality. Um, Neil Gaiman did this last week on Twitter, so I feel safe saying archive of our own, uh, AO3, if you look at the tags that are used, there's just this pro proliferation of categories, and some of them are deeply problematic, and some of them are deeply liberatory, and really quite wonderful to see communities actually talking about eroticism in these ways that are so much more expanded from those of us who studied Freud and thought he had something helpful to say. Um, and so that's something to look at because also these communities are starting to talk about ways of dealing with the ethical dimensions of this. There are some, again, deeply ethically problematic things going on on this website, but there are also people starting to grapple with how do we address it? How do we talk about the ethics of a desire, which is not something that we can, that we typically think of as chosen? Um, how do we work that out through fiction, perhaps, instead of actual actions? Um, so a lot of opportunities for these discussions are already happening and are already proliferating online, and it's really fascinating to watch. Before we move on, Marquise, do you want to add anything to this? So I don't have much to add um, to, to this. Um, all I'll add is I love how thorny the question of like, the possibility of PV, as you're calling it, um, might be might be rethought as a kink rather than this kind of generalized possess sexual orientation. I love the thorniness of that. Um, and it's not lost on me that that rhymes with horniness of that. Um, so I, I I appreciate that. I do. Uh, I, like Holly, don't have an answer for this, yes or no. Um, but I, I do like that the question is being asked because one of the things I find myself often gravitating toward is asking questions. It seems we aren't supposed to allow to something like that ask. Um, so I like that. The other thing I'll say is um, the word you use is kind of discombobulation, which I also really deeply like and appreciate because that to me, this sense of what I would understand as being kind of thrown outside of oneself or uh, experiencing oneself in ways that are unfamiliar, uh, feeling confused about one's very the ground of one's own subjectivity, I find that incredibly generative for thinking about other ways to inhabit the world that do not simply unquestioningly adhere to the categorization that we've been said we have to we have to adhere to. Uh, and I think that's incredibly generative. And I want to actually proliferate that sense, that feeling of discombobulation as perhaps a politics, even uh, as in many ways, the thing, especially for those who are inscribed in normative kinds of identities, I want to proliferate that as a politics of perhaps even a certain kind of radicality, a certain way of refusing these normative categorizations that one is said to have to adhere to. There is something incredibly generative 
radical and I think illuminative in that. So I appreciate that as well. So, but that's all I got. That's all I got for y'all. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for your talks. My name is Surdur um, from the University of Memphis. My question is particularly for Talia, but I think it also speaks to Marquise's talk. Um, it's part clarificatory and maybe critical based on the clarification. So I'm interested in your critique of the categorization model, um, particularly when you talk about um, categories being hotshot concepts and how they're embedded in this um, history of science and the divine feminine. Um, I understood the rest of your talk to be arguing um, that because of that, we sort of need to move away from discourses of categories um, because they're yeah just like busting philosophical moves and not actually having any concrete impact. Um, and you can clarif clarify that if needed, but um, if that's a correct reading, I think that discourses, um, I think that's something that might complicate that would be discourses that are based on engaging with categories from a genealogical standpoint um, as, a, as a form of critique. And I'm thinking in particular, um, the Lagones article that you mentioned the um, colonial modern gender system. I think that's the one where she's engaging with Oyewumi and her sort of unpacking of man and woman as a mistranslation of Obunrin and Okunrin. You can sort of say that that's a very like highfalutin academic discourse, but I think that that might have more concrete manifestations um, as Marquise talked about, particularly like at the skate park, like at the punk show, very like, concrete instances of everyday trans interaction um, where it might give you the tools to say, as Marquis beautifully put, it's not that I am non-binary, but that I understand myself through non-binary-ness. Um, and you might say that, again, that's kind of like a highfalutin academic way of thinking. But I think that like, like when white trans people, white queer people sort of read, for example, my own trans femininity as being something that is moving through binaries or mixing binaries together genealogy kind of in the oyewumi vein kind of gives me the tools to say no i'm i'm actually like i haven't been brought up with those categories the way you have um i'm from pakistan we don't do that here um i'm just not invested in stuff like that at all so in essence like what do you think that approach um has to do with your sort of argument of sidestepping the categorization model? Okay, um, that's a great question. And I really appreci appreciate the richness in it. And so I just want to, you know, clarify that, you know, <laughs> and I say this particularly with my sort of grounding and analytic philosophy, I'm not saying that we go away from concepts or don't look at concepts. But I'm more interested in concepts as they are part of and are embedded in um, extra discursive practices. So practices of intimacy, right? And so specifically what I was talking about earlier on is like, let's look at the ways in which categories or concepts can function to abuse, to oppress or resist, right? And, and that requires looking at their operations within a more complicated repertoire of extra discursive practices. And I think that is very congenial to the genealogical approach, you know, and to which I'm very friendly. Um, you know, but what you've done is, and so I think, again, I think that, you know, looking at concepts is fine, so long as they're put in their place, so long as they're sort of like, so we're not looking at, oh, let's frame a particular model of oppression through this category, as if the category itself didn't have a history, weren't implicated in complicated extra discursive practices that function in various different ways, and this alone is sort of the starting point and sort of the move that I want to make is not to say, don't look at categories, but put them in their place with everything else, you know? And I think that, um, so I think that what you're saying, and I think that the, the, the approach that you're advocating is, you know, congenial with what I would urge. I don't, I don't see a difference there really. Um, I am, and, and maybe this is what gave you that sort of impression is I do find myself often irritated by sort of like a kind of um, traditional analytic philosophical approach to trans issues 
where, you know, the whole business of the day is to try to figure out how we can get trans identities to be valid on some sort of model of what concepts are doing. Um, and I have to say, I see that as a, a virtually, you know, pointless endeavor. Um, looking at the history of concepts, however, that, that I'm down with that. Looking at the, the damage they do, I'm down with that. Or the good that they do in some situation, right? Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Thanks. I know there are several questions still, but we are out of time. Um, and so I'm going to encourage you to find our speakers at lunch or breaks if you can and continue these conversations. But let's thank our panelists one more time for this great conversation. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'm really so glad Marquise, if you can still hear me, if they can still hear me, um, was able to join uh, despite uh, jury duties uh, inconvenience. Um, such a, a, a great contribution. It would not have been the same uh, without you. Um, so anyway, uh, after this, um, you're in concurrent sessions. Uh, then there'll be the lunch break. And then there'll be another set of concurrent sessions before we're back here for the second plenary panel of the day, which is the Hypatia looking back one. Um, so if you are going to uh, G GSH, Global Scholars Hall 103, you're going that way. Um, it's you know it's sort of over by a library-ish looking little nook. Um, if you're in 130, 131, or 130, you're just going right and then immediately left down a little gallery hallway. Um, and that will also be after the second uh, concurrent session in the afternoon, uh, there will be coffee and, uh, and sodas and snacks uh, in that little sort of gallery area connected to 130, 131, and 132. Um, and not this kind